I'm Adam Beeman. I make expensive high precision tooling and today I want to talk to you about how not to make expensive high precision tooling in the form of the V-Block. The V-Block is probably one of my favorite things to make as a tool and die maker. A lot of things have to go quite right in order for it to be a good V-Block. Uh, it has to be flat, square, and parallel. You have to have uh, good angular surfaces, and overall you have to kind of adhere to a strict process in order to get everything to come out the way you want it. Um, that process most of the time is grinding, but um, this V-block is hard melt. You would never know it. It looks near ground. Uh, I've had wire EDM V-blocks. And um, so there's a lot of ways to make them, but at the end of it, they're all kind of expensive. and one of the things you discover is that V-blocks, while very universal looking, tend to be built for specific ranges of parts. If you get on eBay and look for machinist or toolmakers V-blocks, you see all kinds of wacky contraptions. Um, the biggest example is when you have something like this with multiple diameters and you need a V-block higher on one end to accommodate it. Um, you have pins with heads on it where you need a V-block that's hollow in the middle so that the head can rest and not, uh, not hang up on the V. Um, all, all kinds of examples of weird esoteric V-blocks and they're all very expensive to make. And uh, for small runs, for inspection purposes, I've taken to 3D printing V-blocks lately. And it's uh, really freed up a lot of time and energy on my part. And I thought I'd share it with you. Um, ultimately, though, the reason I want to share it is I recently passed my three-year anniversary of being self-employed, and that's actually just been three years of isolation, and one of the things I've noticed in reflection is that my ability to communicate technical ideas has begun to atrophy. And so I think making videos and sharing content is uh, something I need to get back into because it'll, it'll help me communicate better. So here we go. So here are my 3D printed V-block examples. I have two philosophies. One is a modular system, and then the other is very extremely part-specific blocks that I'll make just to the size of the block. Uh, they both work on the same concept, which is the part rides on a dowel or a carbide rod in this case, which is held into the plastic via a even smaller V and then a small compliant hinge. Um, so the four dowels bear the weight and then this end stop, and that makes for a really kinematic uh, setup. And because of the way the dowels mount, they don't even need to be perfectly aligned this way. Um, it can be grossly misaligned, and the part still tracks on its own axis quite e accurately. Um, so it, it's a really good way of doing things. <clears throat> And with the part-specific ones, uh, I, I, I generally am making those because I have an odd angle. So like a five-sided spline, um, I'll have a 108-degree block. So it registers on two to the diameter lands. Or if it's a, a three-sided part, I might have a 60-degree block. And 60-degree um, blocks are actually pretty challenging to make, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But... Um, being able to print it takes a lot of that out. Um, back to the modular ones, we, we usually have some kind of base. In this case, it's just punch stock. In this one, I have hard threaded the side and the end so I could attach my NOGA indicator directly. And uh, this one, it's still just solid and I have an end stop on it. Um, it doesn't have to be accurate. I just have a lot of punch stock. It could be aluminum extrusion, um, linear shafting, if you're a Swiss shop, maybe it's a piece of remnant bar stock. If you have a, a toolmaker's ledge on your granite, usually like a little undercut section, you can attach your 3D prints directly to that. And I think that'd be a really good way to do things. Uh, so don't get hung up on what the base needs to be. On my stop, this is also a piece of carbide and it has a very sharp corner. And that's kind of important because on a lot of smaller sh uh, shafts, You'll have a center hole maybe, and you have a, an extremely small land to register the stop up against. So having a sharp corner that you can adjust up and down 
allows you to get exactly where you want to be and uh, <clears throat> that makes life a lot easier. Most tool makers if asked to make a V-block are probably going to approach it something like this. They'll have the block on a 45 degree angle and then starting in the center of the block they're going to contact the face and then grind outwards. That center out part is important. What that does is it keeps this corner of the wheel from breaking down and gives you the flattest possible face all the way to the center. Once that's done, they'll take the block and rotate it 180 degrees and then repeat the process. And what that yields is a perfectly centered V. Very slick, very robust way of doing things. The only thing you gotta watch out for is angular misalignment. Speck of dust here, speck of dust here, all of a sudden your V faces are not going the same direction. Other than that, it's great. Where the wheels fall off the bus though is when it's an acute angle V-block. This process does not work when you get to a 60 degree angle So v. the problem is quite simple to see. The upper angle of the V prevents the wheel from getting all the way to the center to grind it. So this methodology does not work for an acute angle V-block. You're left with form grinding, hard milling, or wire EDM. All of which are great process and work great, but they take a lot longer than the simple grind job. So just wrapping things up, it occurred to me I never really went over why you might want to check something for concentricity or roundness on a, a V-block set uh, versus, say, a center set. And it kind of boils down to this. In the tool and die world, we don't really see a lot of centers. If you think about the function of a punch um, pushing through a piece of metal, it can't have a center hole on the end. So my world has uh, learned to do its job without centers. Um, and then like a lot of the components in dies don't have center holes either. Like this is an agathon pen and bushing set and neither the pen nor bushing could be checked over centers. So we, we would use a 45 degree V block to check a lot of things. And where I stole the idea was from a uh, company that, that builds punch grinders, uh, Rollomatic, they're a Swiss company. And that's where I first saw the, uh, the carbide rods as the, the Vs of the V block. And uh, I adapted it for 3D printing. Um, that being said, I don't even think uh, the 3D printed V blocks are, are something novel. I think uh, ammunition reloaders have been doing that for a while, but they use, uh, they use ball bearings for their contact points. But um, uh, another nice thing about the V blocks, and this is probably the final final thing I say, is you can you can have a very small diameter shaft because the two two rods butt together. You don't need a undercut, like on this V block that I I made. The shaft would fall right into the undercut. Um, so e even if you wire EDM your V block. And you're using 10 thou wire, you're, you're still going to have, you know, a 5 thou radius, or if you undercut it, a, a 10 thou wide undercut, and you'll be limited in how big of a part you can check. So th this technique certainly has some application, and I, I think for a lot of examples, 3D printing is just fine. Um, you're a little limited on part weight. You'll notice most of the stuff I do is pretty small. Uh, this isn't going to be checking like giant pump shafts. But uh, if the parts fit in your hand, I, th I think this will suit you really well. And uh, if you guys do adopt this, I'd be really curious to see what you come up with. Uh, so thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.